Welcome back to another video. This one's going to be about transformers. In particular, I'm going to build a planner transformer. So one that has a PCB or multiple PCBs as windings. And I also want to talk about how to size the transformer properly to be able to achieve good efficiency and performance. So there's four basic things that we have to be careful about while designing a transformer. The first one is the loss in the wires due to resistivity of the copper or the conductor that you're using. Essentially here the point is that we have to have the proper cross section to avoid too much loss in the copper. And because we're using a PCB with a one ounce per square foot of copper, beautiful measurement unit by the way, this means that the thickness is already set and we just have to choose how wide our trace is going to be. We could use the rule of 5 amps maximum for every square millimeter of cross section of copper. And this means that on a one meter long cable with five amps, you get about 0.4 watts of loss. Doing a little math, knowing that we want uh, 50 watts of power transferred and uh, 30 volts on the input, we know that we're going to have to have a PCB trace of about one centimeter in width, which is definitely too much. The fact is though, that the power loss of 0.4 watts over the meter of cable is proportional to the volume of the copper which means that if we have lower current, we can have lower volume or cross section of copper. And the trace is probably gonna be less than one meter long. So we can afford to make it a little bit thinner and have more losses. So I use DigiKey's online tool for sizing PCB traces, not sponsored by the way. And this tells us that we can use a few millimeters in width to get a relatively low loss of definitely less than half a watt. The second point is limiting the magnetizing current. In general, the rule is to keep it at 10% of the maximum power current. Knowing the input voltage and the frequency, we can find what the primary inductance is to keep this current as low as we want it. Knowing the inductance factor of our core, we can find what the number of turns on the primary has to be to achieve that desired inductance. The third point to be careful about is core saturation. We want the magnetic flux density to be lower than the saturation point, and this depends on what ferrite you're using. In this case, I'm using a 3F4 type ferrite. Looking at the data sheet, we can see that staying under 250 milliteslas is probably a good idea. So using the formula for flux density, we can find that the peak is going to be around 15 milliteslas, which is very, very low, and I guess good for efficiency, but it means that our core is way too big for the power that we're using. The reason I say that it's gonna be good for efficiency is because of the fourth point, which is losses due to magnetic hysteresis and eddy currents. The data sheet of a core should always give a graph of what the losses are based on the frequency and the peak magnetic flux density. We can see that in our case, I'm going to be using a 250 kilohertz frequency and at 15 milliteslas, it's off the charts. So it's gonna be incredibly low losses. So at this point, it's time to design the PCB windings to make the transformer. The first thing I did was measure the core, and then I can use those measurements to make the PCB outline. I decided to make two different types of windings, one all on one side, so seven turns on a single layer. And then I make a second version where half of the windings are on one side, and the other half are on the back layer. At this point, it was time to export the Gerber files and zip them all together. The first thing I did was upload the project to PCBWay's Gerber File Viewer. This is a great tool that I always use to double check that I exported the files correctly. PCBWay gives you an instant quote based on all your project parameters. After that you can upload your project files and an engineer takes a look at them and within 10 minutes or so lets you know if everything looks fine and it's ready for manufacturing. Once you confirm your order it goes immediately into production and you can even take a look at what point it is during the production process and as soon as they're done they'll ship it to your house. It took about three days to get here so now it's time to open the package and look at our new PCBs. Here they are out of the package they're looking great and just flawless and trying them on the core you can see the dimensions are also perfect. So if you're looking to take your electronics projects to the next level head over to pcbway.com and order your professional PCBs today. Alright, so it's time to test these things out, see if they work. What I'm going to do is assemble the transformer and then use it on the half bridge converter that I built in the last video so you can check it out here if you want. The first test is going to be with the single sided PCBs and obviously a single secondary with the output being rectified by a full bridge rectifier. For all the tests in this video I'll have 20 volts on the input and I'll use the variable load on the output that I built a long time ago. 
Keeping the duty cycle constant, I'll change the output current and then I'll calculate the efficiency for the different currents and plot them on a graph. And so this is the result. We can see that the efficiency peaks around the low powers. This is probably because I'm not considering the power for the switching circuit uh, because I'm trying to measure more the transformer and less the converter. So now it's time to try the PCBs with the uh, windings on both the front and the back layer. I'm expecting a better efficiency with these because we should have more copper to conduct the same current, so lower losses. Looking at the graph though, we can see that it's very similar. I didn't go up to the maximum current because there was a little bit of a problem with noise shutting off the switching circuit and I only solve that later on. But aside from that I can basically say that it doesn't change anything. I was expecting for it to be a little bit better but I guess not. Now just in general I was hoping for a higher overall efficiency and so that got me thinking maybe I should change the diodes on the output instead of using a full bridge rectifier which is basically the wrong way of doing things. I should try making a double secondary so that I can only use two diodes one of which is conducting at any given moment. So that's what I did. I got another winding. Two of them are going to be the secondary and then one's going to be the primary and I sandwiched the primary between the two secondaries. This is done mainly to keep things symmetrical but also to decrease the stray inductance and so now it's time to measure the efficiency with this new circuit. And this is the result. We can see the efficiency is a lot better, getting close to 90%, which I have to say I'm a lot happier about. Also, it doesn't seem like the efficiency is dropping with the higher powers. I'm not sure why it's not happening if it was happening before. I'll let you find some theory of your own and post it in the comments. The reason why this last graph doesn't go down to 20 milliamps is because the electronic load for some reason wasn't working properly and didn't let me go down to low currents. But aside from those details, I think this shows a very important improvement over the ones before with the four diodes. So this is definitely something to keep in mind when you're building a switch mode power supply. Well, I guess that's about it for this video. If you enjoyed it, you can leave a thumbs up, subscribe, all that stuff. Thanks so much for watching. If you have any comments or uh, suggestions or anything else, leave them in the comment sections. And I hope to see you in the next one.